We're here at the CROI, the Conference on Retrovirology and Opportunistic Infections, here with Amalio Talenti from the University of Lausanne, and also with uh, Jacques, Fillet. Jacques Fillet, who is with Duke University. Yes. And we're hopeful that we can get from them a sense of where gen human genomics is going. Uh, both of you are working in that area. You've done a little bit more in other areas. But, but Amalio, why don't we start out, start out with you? And um, what are you bringing to the conference this year in human genomics? Okay, I, th I think this year for the third time the conference asked me to organize the activities around what appears to many to be a new field or an mm -hmm. emergent field. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, as any emergent field, one of hope mm -hmm. for a number of uh, specific issues. There's people in vaccine interested in how humans respond to vaccine. There's people in predictive medicine or personalized medicine interested in knowing how people will evolve in their disease. Mm -hmm. There is people in drug um, development interested in how people are different in their response to drugs or to toxicity. And then there's basic science interested in why we are susceptible to start with. So mm -hmm. why are humans susceptible? And there is behind that, there's certainly genetics. Mm -hmm. The work that you're doing is going to affect um, the, the vaccines, and I think that may be the emerging area that, that the way the vaccines will now, as we say, we're stepping back and taking a new look at what is going to, what a vaccine may look like and where will it come from. Will it be mostly in... So I think that's a question that I would like to pass to my colleague, Jacques Fellet, okay. because he works for the Center of HIV AIDS Vaccine mm -hmm. Immunology, uh, supported by the NIH, and why the NIH has decided to support uh, very strongly, the same mm -hmm. thing as the Bill Gates Foundation, the discoveries in host genetics in the field of vaccines. So there's mm -hmm. something that I hope Jacques will explain <coughs> to us uh, mm -hmm. that leaders in the field consider worth funding in the field of vaccine, even though it looks like something far away. Yeah, yeah it, it, it goes in the global uh, direction of the field right now. You have probably heard about the fact that in HIV vaccine, it's time, it was time at least a year or two ago to go back to basics because mm -hmm. the usual recipe to fight diseases with vaccines just failed in HIV. So the idea was to, to ask the question, so where do we go now? We tried to use the immunology. We tried to use the old, um, the old tools that aren't successful here. So it is time to try to find another way. And the promising uh, other way that was offering to us was to look at what the nature has to offer, at the models that are readily available. And the models are in the individuals that are exposed or are suffering from infections uh, by the, the HIV virus. Because some of the individuals that are either exposed or infected have very spatial behavior in the sense that they are able to react to the virus in a different way. That could be a very good teaching tool for scientists mm -hmm. and in order to understand what's going on and how we could, after, engineer something that would be able to fight the disease. So we have fantastic examples of those people that are exposed to the virus at the first place and never got infected. Mm -hmm. So if we can understand why, we have some clues, at least in patients of uh, European mm -hmm. ancestry, uh, there are some genetic mutations that protect against the virus. There are others out there that we could learn from and we could try to reinvent something once we know that. And there are also huge difference between individuals that are infected in their ability to control the virus. You know that some people will rapidly develop uh, immunodeficiency while others will have 20, 30 years of disease without any symptoms and with quite yeah. low viral loads. The elite so controllers. Elite controllers are the, the, the very good example of that. So, and they are, we understand a little bit why mm -hmm. this is so, but most of it has still to be uncovered. We don't really know why some people are very high or other very low concentration of virus in their blood. But you so believe it may be because of the genomic structure in that particular human? Exactly. Different so from another, which is, you know, many, many, I mean, it's just there's a few people that are <coughs> in this. Uh, that's why they call them elite controllers. There's only a small number of people that are. Yes, there. and those represent the end, one end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But it is not because somebody has some virus in his blood that he has 
nothing. It's not a yes or no question. Mm -hmm. So the genetic All background, in between. Yeah, yeah, the genetic background will, will be different between individuals. And mm -hmm. in studying the person that are at the extreme end of the spectrum, we have more chance to get a clue of what is really protective, for example. Mm -hmm. We could also study the other opposite, uh, mm -hmm. people progressing in the first year after mm -hmm. infection and understanding what is wrong with their immune defenses, for example. And if we can understand that, and the more we understand that, the more target we'll have for new ideas on how the disease develops mm -hmm. and new ideas for uh, drug target or vaccine development targets. And that's, that's the main goal of the human genomics field, is to, to look at the human genome, all, all those ACTG letters that build the DNA mm -hmm. we have, and to, to see the differences between people that makes them more or less susceptible to resist or not to resist to infection. Kind of just a side question. So, we, like we say, is there anything else? I mean, genomics, gene therapy is, is one. That's what you're working on. Do you know that there are other areas that we could work in when we say we take the big step back and now mm -hmm. we look at what other areas there are? I mean, is there other whole areas that we could work in <coughs> so, I mean, there's something a bit even more visionary. It's called systems biology. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, another area where investment is being uh, moved forward. Mm -hmm. and, and there we're talking about big time money. Mm -hmm. And this is an approach that brings into uh, medicine and into this type of research uh, the m most powerful tools of uh, informatics and mathematics. And basically, what they recreate is a total modeling of behavior at molecular level or at biological level or even at the individual level mm -hmm. by capturing the parameters that determine uh, how things interact. It's a bit like if we were doing planetary Custom. alignment and yeah. we say, okay, these planets displace themselves with this speed and goes into the proximity of the, of the other one, they interact by this type of gravitational things, this type of very complex mm -hmm. and very informatic, expensive uh, approaches are now being brought also into the arena. But it, it may not be affordable. It, would, it seems like it's very high tech. It and is affordable in the sense that the budget is following. For example, mm -hmm. NIH has provided last year 64 million for this new concept of systems biology. So far, earmarked for uh, influenza, for, the, for flu. Mm -hmm. It's been earmarked for some of the bio bioterrorism, okay. of course, for Staphylococcus aureus as a major pathogen in hospitals, for SARS, mm -hmm. for West Nile fever. Uh, so, th yes, the, the NIH is putting funds in that field, and I think next is HIV. So getting back to now the genomics, this is something that you would then, once you learn the information, is this something that we would then see in developing a uh, vaccine which would be induced in everyone uh, in a very specific way, or would this be a generalized, uh, or, or would you, because you're saying that each person would be on this spectrum, so do you have varying types of, of of uh, vaccinations you can see? I mean, maybe we're too soon to kind of so ask we, that question. It's or hard question. to it's hard to really know what we'll find. But mm -hmm. what I can say is it is not because we find it only in a tiny percentage of the population that it will be only useful for a tiny fraction of the infected mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, exposed persons. Uh, if we find something that is a clue to understanding what's going on with HIV, it can be applied uh, very widely, and the best example, recent example we have of that is the new class of anti-HIV drugs, CCR5 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Maraviroc has been designed because of something that is known in the genome, the that Delta people, 32. Delta 32, yeah. Yeah, they have no CCR5, they resist, so the drugs ha has been mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. uh, that protects people because it gets rid of the CCR5 that they have. Uh, following the same model, we could we could find something that would be directly useful to develop a new drug or a new mm -hmm. pre-exposure prophylaxis or whatever. Or we could find something more subtle that could be used by immunologists or by other scientists to put in their general concept of developing a vaccine. Okay. But it will be uh, more a uh, multi-step process and it mm -hmm. won't be as immediately useful. 